Wow, we are moving just full steam ahead in 2021, and we have another amazing, original, beautiful guest on today's Freedom Sisters podcast, Brigadier General Lori Sutton, or should we say New York City Mayor Candidate Lori Sutton. Y'all, she is an incredible incredible voice in the political space and the veteran space for women and men alike. And I'm just so thankful and humble that she took time out of her incredibly busy schedule to come sit down with us over here at the Freedom Sisters podcast. And what I really want you guys to know about her is that she is so dynamic and so smart and her lifelong journey towards wisdom is really what keeps her going in staying connected and staying in service and doing what is best for the people around her. Now, she is known for being the highest ranking psychiatrist to ever serve in the army still to date. And some of the things that led her to that path into the military was this. The role models she grew up with were compassionate and gracious and would allow her to like ask questions and they would pour into her with all their expertise. And her mom had, was an open heart surgeon and did incredible things around the world. But get this y'all, her grandmother had her master's in business administration in the 1920s. I mean, it's really unheard of. Her foundational roots are really what has shaped her to be such an incredible and dynamic woman in, in both the military and in the political space. So think about your own role models in your life and how they have shaped you to be the woman you're supposed to be. I want you guys to think about that as we're talking. And then think about the hope of what you want for your future. We talk a lot about the don't ask, don't tell, and the policies that are in place in the military sometimes that just don't align with the core values of who we are as human beings, especially those bedrock values of integrity and respect and honor and duty that we really believe for those of us that serve, especially in the army, right? And when Admiral Mullen took away, made the improvement, and banished Don't Ask, Don't Tell, he really did something so great for our military force. Because in that space, we were really violating the integrity of who we are fundamentally as human beings. And it goes against every common core value of the army to show up as a lie. You know, we're supposed to do the right thing, even when no one is watching, but yet you're lying. It really doesn't align with that value. And so he was an incredible leader to banish that policy and allow people to serve openly, authentically who you are, because it makes a better force. It makes a better community. And so we talked about that and how we're continuing to move in the right direction. So I want you guys to think about what it is in your life where you are stopping something that doesn't align with those bedrock values that you have and the hope that you're moving towards in the future. I want you to think about that as we're having this conversation. And then lastly, y'all, she literally is running for the mayor of New York City. And this is incredible. I love New York. When I think of what the world thinks about when they think of America, it is that city. And what a wonderful leader that New York city gets the opportunity potentially to have as their head figure in that community. Here's the thing. She was looking around left to right of who was going to be the leadership that New York City needed. And she couldn't count herself out because here she was on the sidelines seeing the problems and seeing how she could help rectify some of the issues and be that leader. And she threw her name in the hat. So here she is in all her glory, my newest friend and my dear sister, Lori Sutton. Y'all are going to walk away from this conversation changed. I can promise you that. So without further ado, let's get into the show. Welcome. I'm Carrie Cheater, and this is the Freedom Sisters Podcast, a show where my sisters in service talk about her life journey from hardships to victories and everything in between. We are the leading media company to amplify women veterans. Welcome to the Freedom Sisters podcast. How are you today? 
I'm doing well, Carrie. Thanks so much for having me on board. I am so, so glad. Today, y'all, we are in for a real treat. We have Brigadier General Lori Sutton and also New York City Mayor Candidate on the show today. You are right now, currently to date, the highest ranking woman we've had on the show. So yay, I'm so excited. And I'm sure you are overly familiar with the lengthy, prestigious introductions. Therefore, I was curious if you would just introduce yourself as how you want us to know you and tell our amazing audience all about the things that you want us to know. Well, thank you so much, Carrie. Thanks so much for all that you and your team are doing to lift up women in service, women in the military, veterans, really means a lot. As far as I'm concerned, I'm Lori. I'm an old soldier still looking to serve and doing, doing what I can to make the world a better place very quickly. I was so privileged to serve nearly 30 years in the Army as a physician, a psychiatrist. These last few years, I served as the founding commissioner here in New York City for the Department of Veterans Services, first city in the country to stand up a municipal agency. Again, a real privilege. And then, you know, as I saw things starting to go in the wrong direction here in the city, and I saw the politics of fear take over, I kept asking myself the question, where is the leadership going to come from that can lead forward and lift up all New Yorkers? I didn't see it, and so I prepared myself, threw my hat in the ring a year ago, and here we are in the middle of this very, very critical race for the future of New York City. I think it's a critical moment for politics across the board right now in our country. And two things I want to say before we get in, because I'm really a hyper squirrel distracted. One, I love your hair. And two, I love your shirt. What oh. a great tribute that is. Oh, I'll oh, tell my you. Goodness. RVG. And in the back, you'll love this. I don't know if you can see the, let me turn around. Can you read the back? Women belong in places where decisions are being made. Yes, that's a that's a wonderful quote of hers. So, yeah, so awesome. Right. So, so great. So I'm truly impressed with you at every level of success and achievement you have. And I'm just so proud of you for stepping in and standing in leadership positions that are so critical in our country. Before you became Brigadier General Sutton, you were Lori, and you achieved the rank as the highest ranking psychiatrist in the Army. I'm curious if you can take us back to those pre-Army Lori days, and is there a memory that sparked your public servant heart that you have traveled down? Oh boy, that's a great question. You know, I was so fortunate in my family to have wonderful role models. My grandfather on my dad's side. He was a missionary in Central and South America. My grandmother, a little British Portuguese woman who just was full of spunk and vigor and would always play catch with me. My grandfather on my mom's side, he was an old time country doctor and I used to go on house calls with him, if you can believe that. And we would, you know, go to the, his patients and that's really where I started to learn about healing, that the healing doesn't start with the medical intervention, the pill or the shot, but it starts with, hey, how are you doing? How are the kids? How are things going? Looking around the house and, you know, just being gracious and interested and, and listening, of course. And then my grandmother on my mom's side, she got her MBA in the 20s, if you can believe it. And wow. she was just a spitfire. My dad, he was involved in um, politics from a young age and he, he joined the army during the Korean War and he was a journalist and my mom was a cardiac nurse. She served on the uh, inaugural Loma Linda University International Heart Team. They went to different countries and set up programs so that open heart surgery could be performed. You know, back in the early 60s, it was really new. Wow. And so I, you know, I, I just was blessed. And I was raised in a small town, Loma Linda, uh, California, and, you know, just was, was inspired by the examples of service, both in my own family, as well as those around me. And, you know, I wouldn't have guessed that this would be the path that my life would take. But one thing that I learned early, early on was just to stay open to the possibilities, to serendipity. I mean, for example, psychiatry, 
I never imagined that I would go into psychiatry. I thought I'd go into cardiology and executive and sports fitness. I loved everything I did in medical school, but there was nothing that quite grabbed me like Dr. Kesey's passion. And so who knew? I, 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 I just am so thankful for, for the examples of service in my early life and those have really stayed with me over the years. Yes, you really did. You had quite a plethora of examples to look up to and pick from. But it's interesting because the very first thing you had talked about was that connection, that human connection. And I really think psychiatry plays a big role in that, that mental health is far sometimes surpasses the physical health well-being. And so that's really interesting that even though you were surprised you went into that, the very first thing you said was that connection, that how are you, how are the kids, which is really a whole part of the holistic journey of healing. So you did college and medical school before you joined the army. And now I'm really always inspired when my sisters and brothers join and hear that, you know, they're LGBTQ and they chose to serve in a time when the military absolutely banned that because quote unquote, homosexuality was incompatible with military service. Did you have any doubts, fears, reservations about serving? knowing that you would face possible further hurdles, not only as a woman, but also um, as a lesbian? You know, let me be very frank. When I joined the army, I really had not reached that level of self-discovery or self-awareness. And so that became then a process while I was in uniform, both working with those who were struggling and suffering under the policy even before don't ask don't tell remember don't ask don't tell was an improvement yeah it was and, a compromise exactly. <laughs> right and so you know it 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 became really a a a journey a question that i lived over time so i feel like we're in such a different place as a military as a country and i will forever be a great to Admiral Mullen, who, when he was chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, he just came out publicly and said, this policy is wrong. It forces our troops to live a lie, and that, that's completely against everything that we stand for. And that really ushered in a whole sea wave of change, which, of course, uh, continues to this day. So, you know, the army that I joined in 1981 is certainly a was a very different army than that which we see around us today. And that's part of why I'm so optimistic about our military and the way ahead. Yeah, for sure. It's interesting because women still serve when they, if you got married, you were kicked out. If you got pregnant, you were kicked out. And so I think there's some similarities to that because you can't always control who you fall. Like I didn't join the army to find a husband, you know, but you, you never know what you're going to find out about yourself but it shouldn't take anything away from your service because you choose to get married, choose to have a same-sex partner. Like all of that, just, I've never understood, you know, I've never understood it. I really wish that we never had to make those decisions. We never had to make those choices, but I'm a huge supporter um, of anyone who wants to serve. And I think so many of us get stuck in that or mindset. It's like, but we are beautifully created complex beings that can hold two things at once that are contradictory, both by experience and education. What advice would you give someone who maybe is struggling with a similar predicament of having a choice, but finding out their discovery might not align with the choice that they're trying to achieve or fit into? It's like, how can you help them maybe overcome that? Well, you know, I think one of the things we learn in military service early on is the importance of values, bedrock values. And, you know, in the Army, leadership, duty, respect, self-service, honor, integrity, and personal courage. You know, at first it started out as a little thing around our neck, but pretty soon it's in our DNA. Yeah. You know, here in the city, I've mm -hmm. told my team, you know, we lead with heart, honor, empathy, accountability, respect, and teamwork. And I think the important piece of that is to understand that if 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 i as an individual am working in an organization that does not align with my values i need to think very seriously about whether or not i stay in that organization because likely things will not go well right. as opposed to serving in an organization like the military 
which has high standards for its values. And of course, being a human enterprise doesn't always live up to its values, but aspirationally, absolutely. And that's, that's what we are as a country, aren't we? Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're, we're working towards a more perfect union. So I think that values are so fundamental and core to who we are and how we serve that that can be really a point of departure if even after, you know, you know, being frank, being candid and determining that our values do not align. I mean, for example, we know a lot more about moral distress now and moral injury. And, you know, what do you think have been some of the mental ramifications, though, of policies like don't ask, don't tell for our service members? Well, I mean, I think it's been a very difficult process, not just for those in the service, but it's been difficult for the, the country and for the world. Many, many parts of the world, it's not safe for someone like me to go and to be openly who I am. I think that we've made progress, for example, in my own field. In 1973, that's when the diagnosis of homosexuality was no longer a diagnosis. It was removed from pathology. But even that was an improvement for where it had been earlier in the 20th century, where it was viewed as a crime, as a, you know, uh, as a, a violation of law and order. And so I think that as we continue to move forward, let's be thankful that we're no longer in the pre don't ask, don't tell period, because of course that's when the military reflected the commonly held religious and moral views of our nation and leaders felt perfectly justified in throwing the book at individuals who happen to love someone of the same sex. Don't ask, don't tell became an improvement, but it was still very, very difficult because as Admiral Mullen so rightly pointed out, it forced individuals to really violate the integrity of who they fundamentally are as a human being. And so now that we're, you know, beyond that, it's still a work in progress. We see the ongoing debates about our transgender brothers and sisters and you know, it, it, it'll take some time to really work its way out, but at least we're not where we were. Yeah. We we'll all be thankful for that. And I think, you know, when you, when you look, Carrie, at just a few years ago, I mean, in the early 90s, that wasn't that long ago. Mm -hmm. There was a, I remember there was a, a survey that showed that some huge pr proportion of the American population said they didn't know anybody who was gay. And you think about now how that has changed with popular culture, first led with Ellen DeGeneres and her bold coming out. For that, she was rewarded with several years of really no employment. But, you know, the shows like Will and Grace and, you know, I mean, it's just come around to where now, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a point of curiosity in many conversations. And that said, I, I'm very respectful understanding that there are those whose faiths, whose traditions of worship and belief, uh, you know, take them in another direction. And so uh, there are other things that we can find commonality with that doesn't have to be a departure. My, my sister recently got married. Actually, her wife is a Marine, a former Marine. And so they just got married this past February. And they were on my podcast in May, I believe. And what I loved about what they said is it goes both ways. Like the respect, like they understand and respected our grandmother, who's an amazing woman of grace and loves them both, just didn't come to their wedding. And they were like, it goes both ways. Like she respects us and loves us. And so we're going to respect and love her choice too. And so I think that's just a really beautiful example that I'm pulling from, like how we can just love each other as human beings, right? I think, you know, once banned, then silenced and later repealed in mid-2011, ending the 17 years of secrecy and silence for that don't ask, don't tell policy. What what is that feel like when you get some kind of liberation from oppression? Like how what a great breakthrough that is. Well, you know, it took a lot of courage by leaders like Admiral Mullen and others who stood up and said this is wrong and this has to change. Leaders within Congress, within the military, veterans in the you know in the community. But I think that that you know the 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 ramifications, the impact of that kind of change. Let me just 
you know, describe to you what it was like for me and my, my Lori. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Lori and Lori. So fun. <laughs> and at least she spells it differently, but you know, we've been together for 10 years now and in 2015, you know, we had our grandkids, Lori's uh, daughter's boys or grandkids. I'm lucky, you know, I never had kids, but I've gone straight to grandkids, which yeah. is <laughs> so right. So we knew that the, the Supreme Court decision would be coming out that Friday. And so we're all lined up. And I heard, you know, our, our then eight-year-old's grandson, Nolan, and as he, as he was watching all the flags and the celebration around the Supreme Court, I heard him asking Lori, he says, yeah, yeah. He says, what's going on? What does this mean? And the, as I heard Lori describe it, you know, little Nolan, this means that any two people, you know, can, now can get married like your mommy and daddy. And I'm thinking to myself, hmm, what about us? <laughs> and so... <laughs> I scampered out to the patio and I called my chief of staff. We were up in Provincetown at the time. We've got a little cottage there. And so I, you know, I worked it out with my chief of staff. Three days later, we were marching in the largest gay pride parade in the world. And so we worked it out to surprise Lori. And the, the ruse was that we were going to get, you know, we, in fact, we did. We got t-shirts for the mayor and the first lady, you know, standing on the right side of history. And we we're going to give them, you know, at the parade and, and it would be a great celebration, which it was. But <laughs> there we were. It was in the middle of Fifth Avenue, the moment of silence, hundreds of thousands lined up and you know, that moment of silence in honor of all who did not live long enough to see this moment. So poignant. Yeah. And then they slipped us under the security guard and ramping up to where the mayor and first lady were. And, you know, Lori's really left brain. I'm more the right brain of the family. And so she's, where are the t-shirts? Where are the t-shirts? So I started looking at the t-shirts. Chief of staff says, it's not about the t-shirts. Propose, dadgummit. <laughs> And that what was so fun then. So we had a big sign and and that night Lori was telling her daughter, Lindsay, you know, about the day's events. And she had CNN on mute. And as she was telling her the story, she looks at CNN. There I am on bended knee with Lori on Fifth Avenue. That is so so incredible. Those kinds of stories just, you know, give me courage and strength and excitement to pass on to the next generation. Thank God the young kids will not have to suffer what previous generations have. And that said, it's still a, a difficult journey and we have to be there for our kids. We have to be there for, as you mentioned, all generations. Yeah. I really feel, you know, God is love and whether you agree or not with someone's choices, all are created equal and all deserve to be treated with respect and kindness. And I love a good proposal story. And that is a great <laughs> proposal story, Lori. Great, great job. On this side of service, what have you learned about yourself and what have you learned about God that as a result of your time in the military? Well, you know, it's interesting that you mentioned that uh, truism from scripture, God is love. Recently, just maybe two or three weeks ago, I saw the news that the Pope had come out, Pope Francis had come out and really endorsed, uh, you know, same-sex couples being able to register and, uh, you know, to have the rights as, uh, you know, as a civil union. And so that's what I put out on Twitter. I just quoted uh, that Bible verse and, you know, said, what a, you know, what a beautiful moment. What a beautiful moment. And to remember that really God is love and, and, you know, so many different manifestations and, and the diversity of, you know, human nature and human beings. I mean, it's just, it's a, it's a wonderful thing. Now, I will say that one of my favorite verses, I love the verse that talks about, he has shown you, O one, what is true and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to love mercy and to do justly and to walk humbly with thy God. And I think that for me, during these last 10 years, that has been a verse that has just continued to 
uh, resonate very deeply within my soul. You know, I, I retired from the military 10 years ago, and it was a time of enormous tumult and, and turbulence and, you know, the Walter Reed story that came out in the post and, and all of the brain injuries and the issues that were going on. And there was nothing really in the background of our senior military uh, and civilian leaders, for that matter, to understand the complexities of brain injuries. And so, you know, I did what I could as long as I could as a psychiatrist. We did incredible work with my team, stood up from an army of one and a piece of paper back in 2007 to a vibrant, the Defense Centers of Excellence for Psychological Health and Traumatic Brain Injury, to include also our absolute flagship NICO, the National Intrepid Center of Excellence. They're adjacent to Walter Reed. People come from all over the country, all over the world to see what integrative brain injury rehabilitation really looks like complete with families, complete with holistic services, complete with state-of-the-art research and clinical interventions. But at the time, it was very, very difficult. And I, I really took the time that I needed to heal and to come out of that experience, really embracing it as a gift. That was my pledge to myself uh, back in June of 2007. And it's something that I always mention to folks because I think it's important. Sometimes people can look at, you know, somebody, you know, like myself and say, oh gosh, what a blessed life, what a blessed career. And, and believe me, I'm the first to say, yeah, indeed. But it's also important to be able to acknowledge and share that for any of us who dare to lead change, it's, it's, it's a tough journey and there are going to be bumps and scrapes and, you know, you got to have backup and you got to know when to hold them, when to fold them, as the old song says. And for me, the most important discovery I made after retiring from the army was coming across the work of Maureen Duffy and Lynn Sperry on mobbing. To this day, every time I mention mobbing and their work, they first started out with a textbook with all the research, then they came out with a handbook on overcoming mobbing, and then I met Dr. Duffy, and I was able to write a little blurb on her next two volumes set on the legal framework for HR departments to really be able to understand what this process is, and I'll just, if you want, I'll just give you a little uh, quick yeah. vignette. Uh -huh. But you think about bullying, one person picking on another, whether it's in a classroom or in a playground or in the workplace, and that's bad enough. Right. Mobbing is a very primitive group instinct that takes place. In fact, you know, the, the Nobel Prize winner who, who coined the term, Conrad Lorenz, back in the 60s, he witnessed this in animals that, you know, one member of the group would be targeted by the group and just absolutely mobbed until the member left, was forced out of the group, was right. ostracized. You know, the birds, you know, it was made into a movie. I mean, it's, it, it's a process now that has been researched. It takes place, whether it's at, you know, Nazi Germany or in, you know, healthcare settings or in condo meetings, any place where yeah. groups and there are organizations that are mob prone and mob resistant. When I learned about this phenomenon and that the research on those who have been mobbed, they've found that the impact on the human mind, body and immune system is akin to what you find in concentration camp survivors. And when I learned that, then it all started to make sense. And I've carried that with me every day ever since. And I offer it to anyone who might be really in a very difficult situation and, mm -hmm. and not know what to do. It gets back to our earlier discussion. Yeah, it does. And it's actually a really good segue for my next question too, which okay. is amazing. 
the since you are a mental health professional and have you have been chosen as a subject matter expert for two documentaries that I could find, Invisible War and Thank You for Your Service. Invisible War is about MST and the struggle with that culture. And then Thank You for Your Service is more about the war trauma and failed policies to address the neglect of service members, specifically with PTSD. Is there anything that the military is doing right? Like we're still seeing this mobbing. And as you're talking about mobbing, like I wanted to go a completely different way because like I think we're seeing that with Corporal Teu, if I could be quite honest. Like it's like, let's make an example out of this one. Let's do this so we could show forces as, as a branch of service that we aren't gonna we're not willy-nilly with this and we're not gonna change that's what it feels like they're pushing back against the justice culture that's pushing forward right now so is there anything that the military is doing right to correct this and what reform is still needed well i will say this that I learned more about being a woman in uniform after I left the army than I ever did that's when the best I was I think I've ever and, heard. And, and you know the deal because when you're in uniform, the last thing you want to do is draw attention to yourself as somehow being different. You know, remember when Dakowitz, the Defense Advisory Committee for Women in the Service, anytime they'd be coming to Fort Hood or the installation, we'd all say, look busy. <laughs> as we didn't want to be, you know, sort of singled out. But I, I well, shortly after I retired from the army, I was contacted by the makers of the invisible war. And of course, my immediate reaction was, no, of course not. I'm not going to write some, you know, I'm not going to participate in some negative movie trashing the DOD. Well, Kirby Dix and Amy Zwire, and they sort of, you know, smiled and, and they said, well, you know, that's what everyone else has said that we've contacted as well. That's their first reaction. Let us tell you a little bit more. And they said, this is not an effort to trash the DOD or the services. We are using their own data. And yes, we are exposing some difficult truths, but with the intention of making things better, needed reforms. That was when I learned so much about the power of culture and the arts, and in this case, documentary films. Because when the Secretary of Defense, Leon Panetta, he saw that film, and within the next 72 hours, he launched more reforms within that three-day period that had taken place in decades. Right. And so I, I will say this, we've made a lot of progress the one sort of hurdle that I believe is still yet to attain is something that Senator Gillibrand actually has been very, very keen on championing. And I worked with Senator Gillibrand for a period of time during that, you know, that time as a veteran before I came here to New York City. Mm -hmm. And that is to say that the, the process of determining what gets prosecuted, what level of offense gets prosecuted, needs to be in the hands of an independent prosecutor who is skilled, knowledgeable about the intricacies, the complexities of sexual trauma, and who can make an objective decision. Absolutely. We within, I think, two or three votes a few years ago, and she has not let up and she won't. She is she is fearless. But I, I really do believe with all my heart that there is an inextricable conflict of interest. As one MST survivor described it, she says, you know, it would be like if my brother molested me and my dad had to decide, you know, what happened and what to do about it. Yeah. Because you know, and, and so it, it just, I, I am very hopeful that at some point the military will see that this does not undermine commander's authority or good order and discipline, but in fact, it really adds to the credibility and the trust that service members can have in yes. their chief of command. A thousand percent. And even from like the lowest, like a company commander, a platoon leader, let's even sure. go drop it down to that level, the amount of responsibility they already have and have to learn, you know, oh my gosh, sensitive items and accountability for people and counseling and mentorship and all these other things that they're responsible for that they're young. As a platoon leader, you might be 20, 21 at the very oldest. That's a lot of responsibility to now then say, oh, here's a 15-6 or here's a, a sharp investigation you need to do. It just really does feel like we need, it's a help, it's an aid, it's a tool, it's a great resource to have. Yeah. And then you can maintain 
the discipline and the good order because they, whatever, however that process looks differently. And then you're not the one making the decision of which side to pick because that is going to change the unit cohesion. It's going to change the, the esprit de corps, the whole thing, because now he's made this decision or she's made this decision and you're good, you're bad. But when you can remove that, I think we'll actually see a greater unit cohesion than we will, than we have. And then we need to weed these people out. Like they have no business serving. Like you take an oath to protect and serve and then are violating people. You're not doing from, from the top on down, you're not doing what you have sworn to do and well, and you know what we learned? I mean, this is the thing. We had always known, of course, the dynamics between, you know, young men and women in the military. And, you know, it's a similar challenge, challenge to what you find on college campuses. We had not appreciated what it means to have a sexual predator in the military. And when we found out that when it comes to predators, the average number of victims for a sexual predator during the course of their, their life, 300. So you think about it, that's part of what may, has made this, this issue so vexing because there are folks who've had, you know, screamed at me as that movie came out saying, I served for 20 years. I never saw anything like that in my, you know, well, you know, when predators are few in number as they are, thankfully, but they are so devastating in terms of the impact that they have, you could serve for 20, 25 years and never come across a predator. But it doesn't mean that they don't exist. Yeah. And the units in which they do exist and, and, and wreak that kind of havoc, it's just, it's horrific. And it's an important dynamic and phenomenon to understand. And I think that's been a, a huge step forward for us. Absolutely. Hey, I'll just interrupting this conversation with Lori real quick to talk to you a little bit about the Freedom Sisters magazine. That's right. It has been published and launched into the world and the feedback has been overwhelmingly positive. And I believe that's because we see the value in what our sister service means to this country. And so in the magazine, we're talking all things women veterans, but we're talking service and success, mentorship and our history. You name it, we're talking about it. And it's been really a phenomenal first week of the publication being out. So if you haven't grabbed a copy of yours, go on over to freedomsisters.com backslash magazine, and that will take you directly to how to download and get it on your phone, your tablet, or your computer. But a little known fun fact, we are a social enterprise, which means we get back to the nonprofit world to the community we love. And so we are going to be loving on different nonprofits every single month. So for the month of January, we are giving back a portion of our proceeds to Vets for the People, whose leader is also featured in this month's magazine. So every purchase made this month, a contribution will be given to Vets for the People to empower their mission and help provide security, justice, and peace for all who serve. All right, now back to our conversation with Lori. Okay, so we're going to shift gears here. I thank you so much for going to those depths with me and talking about your service and all of those things, because I really do think those matter, especially when we transition out of uniform and we have this silence and we have to sit with it and we have to heal. And you kind of, you made all kinds of great points, especially about that healing piece. And I think it's really important for us to talk about hardships and victories and to help our sisterhood really. And I am just deeply intrigued with your knowledge. So I'm so glad that you were very open and great with your wisdom on, on those topics, but your service is not ended. It's gone beyond the uniform and you are a tremendous champion for the veteran community. In 2014, you were appointed by New York City's mayor, Bill De, De Blasio, I don't know if I'm saying his name right, as commissioner of the mayor's Office of Veterans Affairs. What was the mission of that agency and how were you selected? Well, you know, so funny. Gary Trudeau of Doonesbury, who by the way, has had perfect pitch over this last well, oh, since uh, 9-11 in chronicling the experiences of post 9-11 veterans, unbelievable the work he's done. Well, I met Gary when he wanted to learn more about PTSD as his character BD was getting ready to leave the hospital at Walter Reed and deal with the uh, unseen wounds of war. Well, so 
Gary introduced me to my Lori. And when we, when I, when I retired from the army, then Gary wrangled us to New York to his hometown in the Adirondacks, Saranac Lake. And we stood up a veteran reintegration program, homeward bound Adirondacks. I was chair of the board for three years. And they, Gary and Jane had an extra apartment in Manhattan. So for the better part of a couple of years, we got upstate New York, downstate New York. Finally, we just, you know, it bit us. We just got the bug for New York and we had stood up an organization. We were doing brain training around the country, around the world, so we could do our work from anywhere. We were in Santa Fe at the time. People in Santa Fe heard that we were moving to Brooklyn because we said, let's just move to Brooklyn for three years and not ask a single question. They said, that's so cool. People yeah. in Brooklyn, when we got here, said, you moved here from Santa Fe? Yes. And within <laughs> just the very few weeks of moving to Brooklyn, you know, we found ourselves starting to talk faster and louder and get more irritated when people would stop in the sidewalk. Well, finally we realized, you know, we're New Yorkers. We love it. Here. <laughs> and it was during that time that we found out, you know, was, there was a new mayor in place and we found out that there was this position, commissioner for the mayor's office of veterans affairs. And I thought, you know, sure that I'd love to do this. Lori brought it to my attention, the New York times. And I thought, you know, not a chance. What do I have to offer a new mayor? I got no, a vote, lot. no connection. <laughs> Well, what I didn't know was the mayor and his wife, all four of their parents served in World War II. So they knew the blessings and the burdens of a military family. And they wanted to That's appoint a commissioner who could make things better for today's military and veteran families. So by that reckoning, I was the perfect choice. So we got going. It was a small little office that had been put into place 30 years earlier. But then there was this convergence of leadership to establish a municipal agency. And a year later, the mayor was signing the paperwork on the deck of the Intrepid. It's been a wild journey. Yeah, wow. There are 210,000 veterans in New York City alone, and veteran homelessness is a concern near and dear to my heart. Why is homelessness so rampant in our veteran community? And then also, you've led the way of reducing it by 90% in New York City. Tell us your ways and how can others implement this? Well, I'll tell you, and this started under President Obama, a national campaign to end veteran homelessness. And you know, over that several year period, we reduced as a nation veteran homelessness by almost 50%, which is awesome. Here in New York, where this work had started before I got here, but I brought my ignorance to the table. That's what I told them when I first came on board in the task force for ending veteran homelessness. They voted in for me to be a new member. And I said, well, you know, I know nothing about homelessness. I said, all of my soldiers always had homes, but maybe my ignorance can be helpful. And they laughed and laughed, but I was really serious. I came and I just listened and I watched. And I realized that, listen, we had lots of landlords and case managers and social workers. But where was the buddy bond, the peer-to-peer -peer bond that we know is so important? Well, so we stood up a team of veteran peer coordinators whose only job was to work with that veteran from the time they hit the shelter to get them into permanent housing. And you know, that length of time when we first started was over 600 days on average. We got that down to 89 days. Now, how did we have such an outsized impact? Well, it was really because we put relationships at the very center of everything that we did. So we understood not only the peer-to-peer -peer buddy bond relationship, we also understood that we needed to have a different relationship with landlords. So we talked to them, we listened to them, we found out what their concerns were, we set up a hotline so they could call us directly and we would bust through the city bureaucracy to put the right veteran in that unit. And then we provided aftercare. And then we partnered not only across the city with public and private and not-for-profit, and we partnered with the federal government, and we absolutely left no stone unturned. We started the vet tracker so that we could then case manage. We recognize that there are really three buckets, three, three major reasons why veterans become homeless. One is they may have uh, uh, disabilities, mental health issues that are so serious that they really need supportive housing and can do great in supportive housing with wraparound services. Well, that's great. There's another group that I, and then so I call them the enduringly homeless. 
The next group is what I call the economically homeless. These are people who are working full time, working families, but they can't make the market rents. Well, let's provide them a subsidy to keep them in their homes and provide them access to training and coursework and ways that they can, you know, up their, their ability to earn a living in New York. Hey. And the third is the episodically homeless. These are the folks who've had a major episode, whether it be health or a job loss or something that's happened in their life, a divorce, and they were doing just fine and then they dropped off. You've got to intervene quick for those folks. So you can see that we just, we, we, we put the veteran at the center of our attention and we made it a relational field where we just tracked it back to every single relationship and then we worked to humanize those relationships and it paid off and it well, continues to pay off you said the core is veterans and then relationship and i'm thinking man the core is love like the just core is letting love. them know that they are seen they are valued and they're worth so much more than what they're experiencing and whoa that's absolutely amazing. i'm sure that was really fulfilling work but you resigned and you have taken the leap to campaign to become the next mayor of new york city why did you feel that that was the next right thing for you you know it's not something that i had thought of before but in the process of standing up this new agency we went from four to 44 people in those three years small agency by city agency standards, but very intentionally yeah. standing up a laboratory, an incubator. And we found that by, we, by doing this, we could take on the toughest challenges facing the city, like homelessness, set up what works for veterans, and then apply the innovations to the greater good. Well, we started doing that in issue after issue, because of course, veterans issues are New Yorkers issues. They're human issues. And as I saw things starting to go the wrong way, I just got increasingly restless and I just kept looking for where was the leadership going to come from that could bring our city together, that could lead us forward and lift up all New Yorkers. I didn't see it. And so I said, you know, nobody's given me permission to sit on the sidelines, not after the country has invested so much in my leadership and now the city. So I prepared myself and a year ago, this month, in fact, put my hat in the ring and we're in the midst of a campaign right this minute. It's incredible. It's so incredible. And that's actually, I stumbled across uh, the hashtag that I follow on Instagram and found you. And so I'm all the way across the country and you were making a big impact, not only in New York City, but all over the place. And, you know, our sisterhood is just going to be cheering you on for sure. I love New York City so much myself. So I grew up in a small town in Idaho and I had the dream of living in New York City. So I'm going to vicariously live through you there because I don't think I'll be going there anytime soon, but I love Broadway shows and oh my gosh, I have so many great fond memories and some good friends there. So I visit. It's amazing. I love it. I love it. Love it. Love it. When the world visualizes America though, I think New York City is the city that comes to mind as the heart of the United States. And what is the impact that you hope to leave on New York City as mayor? And what would you want your lasting legacy to be for the world? You know, I think it would be an extension of what I brought to the army, to the military for all of those years. I came to the military really vowing to myself that I would leave the services, I would leave the military in a different shape than what I found it, meaning that I wanted to bring a more holistic approach, mind, body, and spirit. And for all of those years, that's what I did. And here in this role as commissioner the last five years, that's what I did. You might want to look up the core four whole health model, which is a really, it's really my life in a pyramid, my career in a pyramid, but that's the approach. In fact, just yesterday, I had a meeting with the Open Center, which is the world's oldest, well, it's the nation's oldest holistic center, urban uh, holistic center, and it's been here in New York since the early 80s we decided, we said, you know, with all that's going on with COVID and we know, we know the, the, the wear and the tear and the corrosion, the moral injury and the moral stress and, mm -hmm. and all that's going on that we need to come up with an all hands on deck approach to, you know, keeping our arms around everyone. Well, you know, after 9-11, they put together a, a, they called it Project Liberty which was that version of an all hands on deck effort. Of course, you know, after 9-11, as 
just overwhelming as that attack was and the way that it affected the the city and the country and the world, of course, Mm -hmm. COVID is even more challenging given that it's taken our economy, it's taken our health. One out of every 400 New Yorkers has died in the, the, the pandemic. We've recognized that our social contract is tattered, it's torn, and now we're in a position to do what I, I say is for us to stand up a city covenant, a different level of bond and promise and respect for those who are on the front lines and putting it you know, all out for us every day and who, who are disproportionately suffering and dying from this pandemic. And so what we're going to do is start what I call Project Grit. I came up with this back in April. I did a little one-on-one video, two-minute video every day because it was such a tough month and that became my practice and my commitment. And Project Grit, in my world, grit is growth, resilience, initiative, and teamwork. And so we're going to have a kickoff for Project Grit next month. And then 2021, each month, we're going to have a different sort of a a building block, a stepping stone. And our hope, our prayer is that by certainly by 2022, which is when the next mayor comes into office, that we would be able to have then an in-person summit and be able to bring those building blocks together. But in the meantime, you know, Zoom is, uh, is the answer and we'll connect in whatever we way we can with with folks because we know that social isolation is just so devastating to the human spirit and so it makes these kinds of forums all the more important so thank you for your service Carrie and all that you're doing for the greater good oh thank you so much this has been such a joy is there anything before I ask my final three questions that you want to add that we have not touched on today you know it's always hard to know how to cover everything so I (laughs) Totally. What I do is I just take the pressure off. Let's just say that this is the beginning of an ongoing dialogue and conversation. And so we don't have to cover everything today. I think we've covered a lot. Yeah, I love this Project Grit. So we'll be um, sharing that with our audience as well. I think it's really incredible. And I don't know a better leader to lead such a thing with your expertise and leadership, with your education and background and your with your, with your education and your experience. I just think it's really incre- incredible for mental health and strong leadership is really needed right now. And I'm just so proud of you that you're stepping into that. Um, well, thanks, Carrie. I mean, it's, you know, it's not just something that I'm doing or that our team's doing. It's really who I am. Mm-hmm. And that's what I want to bring to New York City. I want to bring all that I am, all that's been given to me and shared with me over the years, I want to now give it to the city that I love and deeply respect. That's so good. All right. So my final three questions are, do you have a podcast recommendation for our listeners? Oh, boy. Well, you know, a year ago, I would have said sit rep. In fact, I'll still say sit rep. That was a podcast that we put into place at the Department of Veteran Services. And we brought in veterans and their family members and you know, you know, civilians and allies from all over the city to be able to talk about their piece of this puzzle in terms of supporting veterans and their, their families. And I think that's a good one. Uh, I think also, and I don't know what the name of it is, but I think there is, I think that Michelle Obama has just recently come out with a podcast. I haven't yet listened to it, but I really, really, really want to listen to her podcast and to be able to, to learn from it. And of course, you know, Freedom Sisters, now that I know about you all, I'll definitely. Oh my gosh. Thank you. That, thank you so much. So we talk about faith a little bit. We did in our conversation here too. And so I'm curious, what do you do to nurture your faith? Is there a practice you have that helps you grow? Absolutely. You know, I, my Lori and I, we love to sing. And so, you know, sometimes we'll just go through the hymnal or now, of course, uh, with you two, we'll think of a song. Last weekend, for example, people get ready. 
it came into my mind, I don't know, it's, an, it's a civil rights anthem. It talks about, you know, people get ready. There's a train a coming. You don't need no luggage. You just get on board. And, you know, we just, we sometimes, you know, the week before that, Leonard Cohen, his song, The Anthem, you know, ring the bells that still can ring. Forget your perfect offering. There's a crack, a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. So that's a practice that we just love. We have so much fun with. And we, you know, Trinity Church is right here in Lower Manhattan. We love their social justice mission. They're closed right now as they revamp their whole Narthex and their security preparations. But there's so much that's going on here within the community. And we love to go visit different churches, different houses of worship, and to really learn from different traditions and faith practices. It's just, uh, gosh, it's, it's, it's just a blessing beyond words. And to live here in a city like no cross, <laughs> crossroads of the world, there's no shortage of oh opportunities. Gosh. That's awesome. And then my final question, Lori, is what has been the greatest impact for your life that your service had? Well, you know, this is a lifelong quest, so I don't, I can't say that I'm there. I'll, I'll never be able to say I'm there, but from the time that I was just a, you know, a young kid, and I don't know where I got this from. I just said, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up, Lori? And I said, wise. Mm. And my life has really been a quest for wisdom, a journey towards wholeness, and it, it's a journey that I'll continue to you know, engage in till the last day I'm here on this earth. And it's, you know, I, I would say that one person that made an enormous difference in my spiritual life is Joseph Campbell. And about the time that I graduated from residency back in the late 80s, he and Bill Moyers had a series of interviews on PBS and I then took his The Power of Myth. I took that book with me to the first Gulf War. It still has sand. It's kind of crusty in the pages now. But I, I, I think, I think my, my many, many years of service at this point, it's given me some perspective on wisdom. It's certainly given me some progress in yeah. terms wholeness and it's it's given me I guess a certain reverence that I feel I just can never repay and so I just want to continue to serve I I you know I can't pay down the principle of all that's been given to me and shared through my service over the years yeah no I think you've answered it that's beautiful but maybe I can just pay down the interest a little bit <laughs> yeah oh my gosh that's awesome Lori this has been so great and I actually just really want to thank you for your wisdom to be quite frank it's been amazing how you've just been so candid and open and honest with this conversation and your commitment to the veteran community New York City and the United States at large you're making them better just by being you um, I'm cheering you on and I'm standing with you you as you're on this political campaign. It's been a real treat being with you today and your unselfish faithful service is yeah. your lasting legacy. Keep those prayers coming, Carrie, and back at you. Thank you so much. Okay, y'all, didn't you just love her? I mean, holy guacamole. Like she literally has so much energy and wisdom and grace and compassion for all people. I just love how she grows her faith and goes to different houses of worship and how she has eradicated homelessness amongst veterans in New York City and how she just continually shows up to be better each and every day and will forever hold learning and wisdom until the very last days that she's here on earth. And I just think she's an incredible leader and I am so excited about this grit project she's got going in. And I'm so excited to see how she weathers this storm and this candidacy and hopefully stands in winning the seat as mayor of New York City. Y'all, my favorite, most favorite part of this entire conversation 
was her incredible proposal story to her Lori. And I just love, it's so endearing how she calls her Lori, my Lori. I just think it's so, so sweet. So anyway, guys, go follow her on Instagram and just tell her thank you for sharing her story. Comment on our Instagram page today about what you liked most from this conversation. Until next week, keep sharing your stories. If you enjoyed the show, please be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. Rate and review this podcast and share with your friends. Until next time, be seen, be heard, be known. Amplify Women Veterans.